Hey, Pastor Mike Virgos here with Northwest Hills Community Church for a Holy Week edition of the Daily Bible Study. Of course, this being the second day of Holy Week. And uh, today we're going to be in Numbers chapter 21, uh, beginning at verse 4. This is certainly going to be a text that will, uh, that will be very good to meditate on as we think about the things of God and what Christ has done uh, during this, this week. And so before we go to Numbers chapter 21 and verse 4, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, our sins are before us. and We failed you in violating your law. We failed you in not doing what we should have done. Uh, Lord, we feel the weight and burden of our sin palpably. And yet your great mercy is amazing. That you sent your son and that it is by his shed blood that we've received the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, I pray we wouldn't take that sacrifice lightly. I pray that as we think upon what Christ has done on his cross and in his victorious resurrection, that this is yet another means by which we come to you in praise. Give us, give us an expansion of our minds so that we might grasp this great sacrifice even more. And Lord, as we study your word, we pray that this would not merely be an intellectual exercise, but that this might be fuel for our worship. Worship both in praise, in prayer, and in obeying you through our lives. And we give you praise. We give you great thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Numbers chapter 21, beginning at verse 4. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And Moses, or rather, and the people spoke against God and Moses, saying, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food or water, and the, we loathe this worthless food. And then the Lord sent fiery servants among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he might take the serpents away from us. And so Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he, when he sees it shall live. And so Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Wow. What a tremendous passage. There is so much going on here. Um, this, of course, is a passage describing an event during the Israelites' wilderness wanderings. There's a pretty consistent pattern in the Old Testament regarding uh, the people of Israel having initial obedience and following Yahweh, their covenant Lord. And then after a while, there's some disobedience and really a disavowal by the people, basically accusing God of taking them out of Egypt to kill them. And uh, that's precisely what happens here. And what God typically does is discipline the people, uh, demonstrate his goodness towards them, and then some of the people repent. Some of them usually die or are scattered abroad. And so we see basically the same exact pattern here as we've seen earlier in the Pentateuch. And so let's take a close look at this passage. The people go around Edom because they, they, evidently that's a hostile territory. They don't want to go around and uh, interact with the Edomites who are hostile individuals. Uh, they're Semitic people, but they are hostile to the people of Israel. And during this time, as they're going around following the instruction of God, they become impatient, which is always the beginning of something tragic and devastating. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Now notice that, the double use of the verb there. Not only were they saying things detrimental to God, but also to Moses. Moses is acting as the intermediary between God and the people of God. He's the mediator. You remember it was Moses who went up on uh, the holy mountain on Sinai. It was Moses that received the law and brought it to the people. It was Moses that constantly intercedes. It was Moses who's at the tent of meeting. Uh, Moses is acting as the high priest of the people of God at this point. He's acting as their mediator. And so uh, the people spoke against both God and Moses. And this is what they said. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Notice the accusation here. God, 
Yeah, you, you purchased our liberation at great price through many mighty miracles and signs, bringing us out of Egypt. But the only reason you did that, God, is to kill us in the desert. That's their accusation. That's their charge. And Moses is in cahoots with you, God. And then they say, for there is no food or water, and we loathe this worthless food. So they're contradicting themselves here. They say on the one hand, there's no food, there's no water. And yet they're alive, they're fed. How are they fed? Manna from heaven. So here God, using miraculous power, feeding and sustaining his people. And they have the nerve to say, the food you've given us, we loathe it. There is no food. There is no there is no water here. Isn't that totally emblematic of what we do in our lives? I know I do that all the time. What happens is I get uh, I get a bunch of discontentment going in my mind. I I think that what God has provided uh, for me isn't enough, or it's not exactly what I want, and then I basically become disgruntled in my prayer life. I uh, had a situation recently where I was really unhappy with the entire situation. I was really frustrated that God wasn't working in the way that I thought. And my wife said something very wise to me. Uh, she said, remember the Lord. Remember who he is. Remember what he has done. And I realized that actually I need to be content with what God is doing in my life, with what he's given me, uh, with where he's put me. And uh, I shouldn't be that way. And so it's so easy to become uh, less than content with what God has done. We become impatient. We want God to do things quicker than he's doing them. And all the while, we must realize that God is working. His timing is for our good, even if he's uh, doing something much slower than we'd like to see it uh, done. So uh, these Egyptians, or rather these Israelites, are saying, I wish you just would have left us in Egypt. Slavery in Egypt would have been better than this, you know. Better than communion with your God, better than manna from heaven, better than freedom. I wish you would have just left us in, in Egypt under the tyranny of Pharaoh. And so verse 6, God responds. He sends fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many of the people of Israel died. So these are evidently poisonous snakes, and if you get bit, you're going you're gonna to die. Now, there's a tremendous irony here sort of lying underneath your English translation. Uh, the term here translated fiery serpents is seraphim. Uh, it is a word that is a takeover from Egyptian. So uh, remember that Moses wrote the Pentateuch, right? The, the first five books of the Bible. Now, as an aside, uh, he didn't write it all. Uh, we know that for sure, at least the end of Deuteronomy, because it talks about his death, certainly Moses didn't write about his own death that was probably written by Joshua, his successor. <clears throat> and you should know that among academic circles, there's a great debate, uh, a many years long debate, probably well over 100 years at this point, a debate regarding who wrote the first five books of the Bible. Uh, historically and traditionally, Christians have said it was Moses who wrote it because Jesus believed that. That's been the teaching of the church for thousands of years. But in the 19th and 20th century, there arose uh, a group of very liberal, uh, theologically liberal uh, theologians uh, led by uh, Wellhausen, who proposed a thesis called the Documentary Hypothesis, which basically said that uh, the Pentateuch wasn't written by Moses, but it was written by a number of redactors and editors. It was polished up by a bunch of people. And so Moses really had nothing to do with the Pentateuch. You know, to say Moses wrote the Pentateuch is a little bit like saying there are leprechauns at the end of a rainbow. And uh, and really this documentary hypothesis, which is summarized in the acronym JEDP, each of those letters representing a different kind of editor, a different kind of author, a different kind of redactor, um, this theory has gone through about a thousand iterations, you know, a thousand, thousand versions of it. Because there's absolutely no evidence for any of it. There's no evidence for uh, for these different redactors. And the rationale, and I don't want to obviously get into the detail of it because I'll bore you, but the rationale is basically a form of circular reasoning. They basically assume their own conclusion and say, yeah, Moses didn't write it. Uh, but Jesus believed uh, that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. And if Jesus believed it, I'm going to believe it, and I don't know about you, but you should believe it because Jesus didn't make any mistakes. He knew exactly who wrote the Pentateuch, and he said it was Moses. And so 
there's really no good reason to say that Moses didn't write the Pentateuch. However, we need to say quite clearly that Moses didn't write all of it. And the viewpoint that I take and, and that's been classically taken by many, uh, many biblical interpreters is what is called supplementarianism. That is to say that I recognize that there are passages that Moses probably didn't write. Uh, now, there, there are not a lot of them, but I think that over time, uh, the text was added to, uh, certainly the end of Deuteronomy, other passages. It was probably polished up and edited, uh, not so much redacted, like completely changed, but edited over time. And that probably happened all the way up to the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, Ezra being uh, the great scholar, and so uh, he probably polished up the Pentateuch a little bit. And that doesn't mean that it's not inspired, doesn't mean that there are errors in it, of course not. Uh, God was working through Ezra and the rest of the, uh, the caretakers of the oracles of God, just in the same way he does today. Um, not that the Bible's changing over time, that's not the point. The point is that God was preserving his word, and yes, Moses wrote the Pentateuch, absolutely. Uh, now, in light of that, remember that Moses lived in Egypt, uh, most of his life. He lived in Egypt in the household of Pharaoh, you know, under the stewardship of one of Pharaoh's daughters. And so Moses spoke Egyptian, likely wrote in Egyptian. He was probably well educated in Egyptian. He also spoke Hebrew and knew uh, the Hebrew tongue. And so as we read the Pentateuch, it's obviously written in Hebrew. But what we find often is uh, Egyptian terms being taken over and and utilized in in the Pentateuch in the first five books. And the term translated fiery serpents is one such example of an Egyptianism that has made its way into the Hebrew Bible. Now, the term here, seraphim, which is translated fiery snakes, as I mentioned, it's an Egyptian word, but there's more to it than that. In Egyptian symbolism and mythology and theology, uh, snakes were important. Uh, fiery serpent was often the symbol of Pharaoh's power and Pharaoh's uh, really deity. <clears throat> and so it wasn't uncommon in ancient in ancient Egypt to find the symbol of snakes and glowing serpents. Uh, in fact, there was a um, there was a foundry, a smelting uh, place uh, that archaeologists discovered not far from this location, as best we can tell, which uh, actually had a bronze you know, an amalgam serpent that had been smelted and, and hammered out there. Uh, so that's quite interesting. So Moses basically is told to do the same thing, to uh, basically hammer out a bronze serpent. We see this in verse 7. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he might take away serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, he shall live. And so Moses made a bronze serpent. Literally, the term there is copper, uh, but it was in all likelihood a um, an alloy of some kind because copper is exceedingly soft. Uh, and so bronze is, is the translation. It's a legitimate translation. And he puts it on the pole. So think about the irony here. The people complain and say, you should have just left us in Egypt because... You know, we would have been uh, happier there, uh, ostensibly, right? And so what does God do? He sends them a plague of fiery snakes, which is the very symbol of Egyptian power. See the irony? Uh, he's basically saying, okay, you want Egypt? Here you go. Here's your fiery uh, serpents. There's a tremendous irony going on there. And what do the people do? They respond in, in repentance after, of course, many of them died. And so they go to Moses. Notice again, Moses is acting as the intermediary. He is the one that the people go to. And as a result, Moses prays. God answers his prayer in the affirmative and gives him a method of salvation. That is this fiery serpent, this bronze serpent erected upon a pole. And so if you get bit by this uh, poisonous snake, uh, you're to go and look at that cursed object there hanging on the pole and your life will be spared. Uh, you'll be saved in a matter of speaking. Now think about all of the uh, foreshadowing going on here. Uh, both foreshadowing, you know, in the past and, and in the future of the scriptures or the illusions going on here, the typological illusions. A serpent represents, of course, the fall. It was the serpent that deceived Eve. Uh, 
It was the serpent that uh, coaxed Adam into uh, eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so a serpent really represents the fall of mankind. It represents uh, the curse upon the earth. It represents all of the the strife and turmoil that man experiences because of his sin. And so serpents don't represent good things. And yet Egypt had the sign of a fiery, a glowing serpent. And so here, uh, there's a plague of serpents. And if you get bit by a serpent, you have to look at an elevated curse, an elevated cursed object, that serpent, and your life would be would be spared. <clears throat> now, of course, this bronze serpent uh, is a typological portrayal or foreshadowing of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see this in a number of places. Jesus pretty consistently alludes back to this passage. I think there's about four times in the Gospels when he does this. Let's look at just one, and I'll make mention of the others. Take a look with me at John chapter 3. John chapter 3, we're just going to look at one verse. Uh, this is the account, of course, of Nicodemus uh, and Jesus talking about the matter of being born again. And um, and so Jesus says in John uh, 3.14, and again, there's a little bit of a debate whether or not these are the words given by John as he writes and narrates the gospel or whether these are the words of Jesus. Um, that is verses 13 through 16. Uh, there's a debate about that. I happen to think these are the words of Jesus. And so look at what it says. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That is to say that uh, just in the same way that the bronze serpent, that cursed object, was erected on the pole, and everybody looked to him to be saved, that or looked to the snake to be saved, Jesus is going to be lifted up similarly, and everyone who looks to him at the same time will be saved. And then he says that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So the salvation offered here is not merely the salvation of your life, but eternal life itself. Now that is really something. Paul tells us in Romans that Jesus became a curse for us. That is to say that Jesus upon that cross took upon himself our sin. He became the sin bearer for you and I, uh, and he was seen as the cursed object in God's sight. He was seen as the one who had committed all of the sins that you and I had done. Think about the sins you've committed, the bad ones that you don't tell anyone about. Jesus took that sin upon himself, knowingly, knowing full well what it was, all of the things that you had done, all of the the thought crimes that you've committed, the despicable things that have been in our minds. Jesus took all of that sin upon himself, representing that cursed serpent, the pride of man in the fall. And he took it upon himself and quenched the wrath of God in three hours' time. Now, you couldn't see the wrath of God being poured out on God's Son. You couldn't see that. You could see the physical sufferings, which were certainly part of God's wrath. But spiritually, there was a tremendous wrath being poured <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me, being poured out on the Son of God. And so we see all kinds of illusions here in Numbers 21. Number one, we see Moses acting as intermediary and really high priest. Jesus does the very same thing. He is the mediator between God and man. Additionally, if we think about uh, John chapter 17, what is known as the high priestly prayer, just in the same way that Moses goes in and prays for God's people and, and achieves a salvation for them, Jesus does the very same thing. And so we see a bit of the a bit of the gospel in in numbers. And look at the mercy of God. These people had been uh such complainers. But consistently, it's almost on every page you find another example of their grumbling. And yet God was merciful. And so I just want to invite you, look to Christ. All the ends of the earth, look to him and you'll find a salvation like none other. Uh, look to this accursed savior who was cursed because of us, who received our wrath and who uh, took upon himself our wrongdoings so that he might give us his righteousness. And if we look to him, we'll be saved. I hope uh, you've enjoyed this study and I hope you'll think about these things as you go throughout the week. If you have any questions, uh, you can email me at info at northwesthillschurch.org. I'd be happy to answer your questions and I pray that the Lord blesses your day. Thanks.